I thought I would do a War Games rules review, the first one for the channel. Uh, probably our club's most favourite set of rules, Altar of Freedom, Grand Tactical Battles of the American Civil War by Greg Wagman of Little Wars TV. This is a fantastic, fantastic set of War Games rules and I'd like to just talk you through uh, how the rules work, uh, give you a general overview um, and also point you in the right direction in terms of some of the great support available. Um, so first of all uh, the rule book itself full colour cover as you would expect um, it's actually black and white uh, inside but this really does not detract from the game and you've got to remember that this was originally printed in 2013 um, second edition was printed in October 16, which is what I've got here. Uh, but it's very, very nicely set out. Uh, simple, easy to read, um, and it's written, uh, if you've watched Little Wars TV, uh, you can tell it's Greg that's written it. It's written in really nice, easy flowing language, um, whether you're an experienced gamer or not. This game um, should be easy for you to pick up. So the rule book has uh, 65 pages in total, um, and at the back we've also got a really simple, quick reference sheet. Uh, to be honest, once you've played it a couple of times, you will be just referring to that. You'll very seldom be going back to the rule book. The rules themselves. Um, actually come in a lot less than that because uh, a lot of the game is the additional extras that come with the book so the rules themselves basic rules that is um, you're probably running at somewhere around 23 pages uh, with some appendices at the back for optional rules army builders scale conversions etc um, but at the back you've also got four excellent scenarios to get you up and running uh, the game is very much scenario led, so um, you know you, you will need to either design your own scenarios or use the scenarios that come in the rule book or in the supplements, which we'll come on to in a moment. So in the book itself, you've got Shiloh, uh, Antietam, Champion Hill, Cedar Creek. Uh, they they're scaled up from sort of small games to large games, and everything you need in there for the scenario. So it tells you uh, the game length, um, the scenario size, uh, the objectives for the Confederates and for the Union sides, a bit of background, special rules, a bit about terrain, the order of battles, uh, who deploys first or second, any reinforcement schedules. You know, there's a lot of forward and work gone into this, but again, it's all set out, very nice, easy to understand language. Uh, and again you will get a, a map and it will actually be set out in grid so you can work out your table size exactly where everything goes and then your orders of battle uh, which again I'll show you in a bit more detail for a different scenario um, will detail your overall commander, any sub commanders and each individual uh, division um, and the brigades that make up those divisions this is, uh, as we said, grand tactical uh, game, so the, the smallest force you're using in the main will be brigades, um, divisions and corps. Okay? Um, so you would need to, to base your figures for your armies accordingly with that. Um, however, basing size is, although recommended in there, uh, I think it's 60 60-30s uh, for infantry brigades. Uh, as long as you're both using the same basing system, there, there really shouldn't be uh, too many challenges from that point of view either. Okay, um, so it's fairly um, flexible around uh, basing and, and, and things like that. Um, but it also gives you, although this is designed for small scales such as six mil, uh, which we use, um, you could adapt it for ten or fifteen. I think you would actually be struggling to do it any uh, greater scale than that because this is grand tactical this isn't regimental or battalion size you know like a fire and fury or a black powder uh, 
type game. So there are two um, supplements available with the rules um, and you can download, you pay and download for those through um, Greg's website um, which is www.6millimeteracw.com uh, You can also find it through the Little Wars TV um, internet site as well and uh, the scenario books are PDFs so you, you download those onto your tablet or your phone so again you can have those with you at your gaming evenings and each one will contain um, a, a sizable number of scenarios again all set out in the format I showed you before so there's about 30 I think just over 30 scenarios across the two uh, supplements so more than enough to keep you going for a very very long time from that point of view as well Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the game sequence itself. Um, again, set out here. Um, so you have um, six parts to uh, a turn in effect. Uh, bid for priority points, turn clock control, highest bid manoeuvres, continue to lower bids, end of turn and end of game. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key uh, drivers within the game priority points uh, this is a big one and one of the things that we really, really love about this game so each command or uh, core commander will have an, uh, a priority point amount allocated to his command uh, if he's the army commander he can delegate these to his uh, under commander so to speak uh, but if he's a divisional stroke core commander uh, he would then have to allocate them to the brigades under his command uh, or, or divisional commanders should I say under his command um, the beauty of this is that uh, this is again where the, the bit of friction comes into the game you can never quite allocate enough where you want so you might want to do certain things with certain divisions so you might have a division over on the left flank uh, wanting to push forward you might have a division on the right flank wanting to do a bit of manoeuvring and you might not have enough points from your overall commander to allocate to the two so you have to prioritize who do you want to move earlier in the turn who do you want to potentially activate later in the turn the issue is it may not happen uh, and that's all led by the turn clock which we'll come on to so priority points is really good you can use priority points to basically um, position how quickly you want your troops to gain the initiative you can use it to enable you to move more troops at the end of a turn who haven't been activated you could use it to try and gain the initiative of the turn clock and how that works so there's lots of ways you can use these priority points and uh, I think that's a really clever dynamic which adds friction and adds a lot of fun into the game as well so that's priority points the turn clock the turn clock is one of the key aspects of this game. The turn clock determines um, how quickly a turn ends or how long it lasts and it's basically governed by the player who has control of the turn clock. So at the beginning of the turn uh, you will determine who has initiative, who gains control of the turn clock and that's done by a dice roll and any allocated priority points and then after each activation of a division and you go from highest priority points downwards uh, both players will roll a dice and the player who has control of the turn clock will pick one of those numbers and reduce the turn clock length accordingly so for example you may have a d10 turn clock on, on a game so it starts at 10 uh, both players roll at the end of the first activation one rolls a six run rolls of three the player may decide he wants to speed the turn through because he wants to he's got his troops activated early or he may want to drag it a little bit because he's got troops with lower priority point allocations so he may decide to deduct the six and take it down to four or deduct the three and take it down to seven and then you will continue with the next priority point number and and those divisions will move out, and then you roll the dice again and this continues and what this does is build in a real element of friction into the game um, because again when you're allocating your priority points you've got to bear in mind you may not get to activate everything you want to so you've got to think very carefully about how you deploy and, and how you utilize your points accordingly 
So that's the turn clock. A couple of other aspects in the game, some which have received a little bit of um, mixed press, should I say? Cavalry. So cavalry in this game um, are not the big Napoleonic uh, cuirassier type cavalry that you would expect. These are more like a mounted infantry, um, more for reconnaissance scouting. Uh, you don't see uh, cavalry, uh, not game winners in this game. Um, they generally don't have fantastic statistics, um, which we'll come on to, and that's mainly because they're small units, not because they're not good quality cavalry. Um, so cavalry do have one really good thing that they can do, and that is if they move close to enemy units, they can discover who they are, and they, in effect they're reporting back, they're using their scouts to find the strength of the enemy, where it is, and then they're reporting back to command. So that's a really nice uh, feel in there. But um, what they're not good at is charging headlong into enemy infantry um, and things like that. However, one of the things that uh, cavalry aren't allowed to do in this game is dismount. And that has caused some questions from various parts. Um, and my view is, okay, that's fine, I understand, and Greg gives very good explanations for that. He's trying to keep this game as simple as he can, but there's nothing to say you can't house rule that. Um, so we, we have a little house rule that allows our cavalry to dismount and to fire at a slightly better modifier than they would if they were mounted. Um, so it just gives you that extra aspect uh, of allowing them to do those extra elements. But cavalry overall I think are really good. The other one is interrupt fire which I think is excellent. Um, so enemy um, activations moving forward, your artillery are allowed to interrupt that movement and open fire. Um, as long as they're not at short range. Um, I like that. I like that a lot. It's a good way of breaking up uh, attacks. Uh, it can also be used artillery very well to do counter battery fire, which um, can silence enemy guns for a turn, which stops them being able to add value to an assault or a defence. Um, I really like that rule as well. So uh, re really good from, from that point of view. Uh, there's no casualty removal specifically, so uh, what you're looking at here is uh, attrition, the morale, uh, the state of the troops gradually being depleted uh, to the point that they're removed completely. So hence you, you're using uh, bigger bases, representing brigades, divisions, etc. So again, I like that. The other thing I really like is the generals and the, the, the commanders. They all have their own personalised traits. And um, those traits are, are not game changers, but they do add some interesting dynamics, uh, some good things and some bad things, and not always positive things. Um, and I really like that. Um, I think that's been blended very nicely. And, and again, you can house rule that, you can add them in, you can take them out, you can do whatever you like with that. Um, and I, I like that I, the, the idea that you can you can design Read, re redesign this game, so to speak, to what your club or how your club wants to play it, which is which is great. Uh, at the back, you've got some appendices, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, these again are optional rules that you can add in once you've had a few games. There's an army builder if you want to design your own games or scenarios, and also scale conversions. So there's a lot in this booklet. There is a lot. Um, but as I say, once you've, once you've played a few games, you probably won't be referring back to it very often. Um, so overall, Ultra Freedom gets very much a thumbs up from me and the guys at the club. We play this a lot. And what I'm going to do in a moment is just show you one of the scenarios, as you saw in my previous video, uh, Seven Pines, and uh, how that would look in, in real terms, uh, figure count, etc. On, on the table. So I'll talk you through... Uh, one of the scenarios there. Okay, so this is the Seven Pines scenario, um, and you can get a flavour for how these are laid out. Um, very nicely laid out indeed. Uh, it explains it's a small scenario, runs for six turns, has a D10 turn clock. Uh, a lot of the scenarios do. Um, tells you a bit about the objectives for either side, a bit of background, and then we move into things like special rules, 
terrain notes, order of battle notes, deployments, reinforcements and the schedule etc. So everything you need to play those scenarios is detailed here and each scenario as you can see is very well researched and, and laid out accordingly. Blocked out some of the areas uh, as you will need to go and buy the rules to see priority points and personality traits but this is just to show you the breakdown of the divisions and brigades and now I'll show you how I've painted those up in preparation for our demonstration game. Okay so just to give you a bit of an overview this is Hooger's division part of Longstreet's corps uh, there's the man himself uh, General Longstreet and then uh, the other division in there is D.H. Hill's division with the artillery support and Anderson's larger division again with its artillery support. We then have Joseph Johnson himself with his appropriate HQ marker and then we go over to Major General Smith uh, with Whiting's division. Um, and there's Smith himself on the right, and that's the division with the artillery. So overall, that is the Confederate forces for Seven Pines. And uh, if you watch my other video, uh, you will see some closer up images and talk around the figures and how they were put together uh, in preparation for this scenario. So I hope that's been a useful review of Altar of Freedom by Greg Wagman. As I say, uh, a massive thumbs up for us. We love this game. We play it a lot. It's an excellent set of rules lots of support available um hope you've enjoyed the review and look forward to seeing you soon